Surprisingly, this is one of the few Castlevania games I've yet to play. And I'm sure it's pretty obvious by now, but Castlevania is pretty high up there as one of my favorite franchises of all time. It's actually the first series I clearly remember playing as a child, specifically 64. So for me to pass on a more fondly remembered game in the series that's had such a large impact on me is kind of wild. And well, that's because Laments of Innocence left a bad impression on me once I finished it. Kind of turned me away from playing the follow-up, sadly. But over the years, I've heard solid things about the sequel. So there must be something here, right? This is Combat Overview. Here we go over the general controls, main mechanics, who or what we use them on, and then seeing how it all comes together. Since Hector is at Belmont, we don't use a vampire killer. Instead, we get to use one or two-handed weapons, hammers and axes, spears for that extra range and coverage to crowd control, and even gauntlets for a more up-close approach, dishing out a barrage of punches and kicks. Yeah, that's a tattoo. Not only that, but our boy does some breakdance moves for attacks as well. And of course, it wouldn't be an Egovania game without some of those out there weapons like an electric guitar, spiked baseball bat, tomfas, minigun, and yeah, the list goes on. Okay, we got a basic combo, which gets longer depending on the tier of weapon. And after each attack, we can chain into a different ender. Whether one had a sword, for example, get this send away, or this little blade toss doing a multi-hit attack before returning. Probably the best one in the game, but we'll get to that later. But yeah, each weapon gets their own little move list to mess with, having their own speed, range, and so on. Oh, and if you jump and attack at the same time, you do this flying kick to launch an enemy. Onto defenses, we have a guard, can move a bit, when negate all damage, it will snap to whatever attacks you. There's even timed blocks that will refill your hearts, and if you attack while guarding, you'll do a launcher. Okay, similar to DMC, while guarding, your jump will do a roll instead. You can do a few of these before dealing with some end lag, so you can't mash these out. But you can cancel attacks by rolling, so not bad. Kinda surprised to see this here, but similar to Ninja Gaiden, you can cancel blocks done with the dodge, so you can quickly reposition. Man, so far, we seem to have some useful options, but yeah, we'll get there when we get there. Looking at the HUD, yellow bar is our health, which can only be increased by level ups from what I can tell. And life max ups aren't a thing either, so they're not hidden or dropped from bosses. Same for how many hearts we can carry. Speaking of that, we don't have sub weapons to help us out. Instead, we get to use the newly added Innocent Devils. So there's a few different types, each having their own little specialties. Fairy types are basically supports, giving out heals, and without them you wouldn't be able to open up chests. Battle types, which you can imagine, are pretty good at fighting up close. Now for the passive, they can build off your combos with the chain attack. So when you see that word splash on screen, you can either get him to jump in from out of nowhere with this dive attack, or to launch enemies. And yeah, they're also used to open up those heavy doors. Bird types focus on airborne enemies, and we can use them to glide over pits. The mage can stop time, and the devil lets us dive underground. So not only do they have uses for combat, but they give us different ways to interact with the map, which is neat. But from what I've explored, which is almost 90% of the map, these don't get used as much as you think. The game will make you use it the one time after you obtain them, but after that, their exploring abilities get tossed to the side pretty much instantly. Well, at least you can swap them freely through the pause menu, then you can put them in auto mode, having them attack whoever with whatever, or guard mode, which has them hunkered down to do nothing but stay on the defensive, or you can pick command mode, giving you full control over their actions by cycling through their options with the d-pad. This mode also gets them to stick close by, so they'll usually focus the same target as you, which is nice. Less extra control over their resources is something to think about because the hearts aren't just for the specials, but it's also needed for them to be out and about. If they take damage, they'll chip at those hearts, and once empty, off they go. So there's a bit of a balancing act to it all. At least hearts drop often enough, and each ID has their own meter, so you can use other ones as backup. They even level up too, not only do they get new attacks, but depending on the weapon type you're using at the time, defeated enemies will drop certain crystals, and with those specific colors, this will lead them down different evolution paths. So there's a bit of synergy between your weapon and the choice of ID. There's also crafting. This is kind of a large part of the game. So materials are dropped by enemies, as you'd expect, or you can steal them from enemies. So after or during specific attacks of theirs, you can steal an item. And if you look closely, when the color of the lock-on turns purple, that's the moment when they're vulnerable. So look out for that and test out some strats to get in close in time. So with all these materials, you can make any kind of weapon or gear you like. And they won't lock you out from creating this stuff either. If you have the required materials, then it's yours. Once you craft it, that'll open up the next tier of that type soon after. And just keeps going from there. There's actually some boss specific items that you can steal too, but they're missable. 
So it becomes a second optional objective to complete before you take him out, which is pretty awesome to do for more experienced players. When it comes to enemies, we take down zombies, knights, wizards, fleamen, and lizardmen. Most of the basics are here. They somehow didn't put their classic Medusa heads, or bats of all things. The game where we take on Dracula and his army doesn't include bats apparently. Kind of a huge miss if you ask me. We go into detail about what they can do, but I don't think it's necessary. Because I took on this tower, which is basically Onimusha's Dark Realms, where you fight every tier of enemy from early to late game. And as you can see, and well I can't see, might have had a glitch where stuff would just cover my screen entirely. You wanna know what I did? The same exact combo for 50 floors straight. All I had was my summon and this little weapon I crafted within the first 30 minutes of starting the game. So I was under geared, possibly under leveled, couldn't see and it didn't make a difference. Because of that, I don't think it's too far fetched to say maybe the one I had a sword is the best weapon, or maybe enemies are way too simple, presenting no counterplay to mashing, or maybe battle IDs can really hard carry you through any fight. Honestly, it just might be all of the above. Bosses on the other hand save this game. Not by a lot, but just enough. We go up against this knight, just swipe out those ankles and dodge the occasional sweeps. Don't get too greedy though because you'll definitely be swatted away. So be ready to block those attacks since our guard is more reliable than it looks. There's a second phase, spitting out these fireballs, so just stay back a little and move in afterwards. Then this dragon can expect the usual tail spins and fire attacks, but whenever you see him lean back, basically standing straight up, be on the lookout for that nose dive of theirs, slamming their head into the ground. You can actually jump on their neck and slash away. You can't fall off, but they give you a pretty awesome view for taking advantage of this. And hey, before they knock you off, you'll get a chance to steal a shortcake. Now Trevor Belmont, from Sotan to Arya and now Curse, this kind of boss fight will always be a cool concept to me, having to take on the Belmont family. Okay, when he backflips three times, he'll toss out a holy water that has a bit of tracking. When he kneels, having all those flames show up, he'll charge you, so watch out. Now he does this combo too. The tail is kind of quick, but if you can dodge it in time, he's left open for a while to land a guaranteed follow-up before he parries you. Very standard stuff, but it works for a reason. You fight him again later with a few more attacks and some tweaks to pass attacks to make it a whole new fight. A fisherman, he'll be riding on top of this giant bonefish. He'll toss javelins at you as they both swim along the side, but try your best to dodge him and get in close to land a few hits. Eventually, he'll jump in the middle, but don't forget about the fish though because it'll still try to attack you. Then this giant minotaur. It'll tear off these pillars to swing at you. If you played Bloodlines, this should look kind of familiar. Yeah, he'll do very wide sweeps up close and the occasional straight on overhead swings. Just watch out for that spin attack of theirs. Isaac, he's gonna be our rival of the game, and he probably should have been named Gary because it's basically a real time Pokemon battle. But here, the trainers swing sharp objects at each other. Yeah, this fight gets pretty wild. Saint Germain, does a lot of teleporting attacks, but he'll be left open if you can dodge him. Pretty straightforward fight, but his gimmick is time. We either stop time to do this large explosive attack, or even heal himself. If you stop time using your ID instead, it'll reduce these effects. Problem is though, unless you have that summon prepped a good while beforehand, you won't be able to stop them. Because when you swap IDs, there's a noticeable amount of downtime before their abilities are even usable. So it's not as snappy and reliable as you'd hope. For all my dual hand enjoyers out there, well, look who's back. They'll start the fight with this jump that sends out shockwaves for you to jump over, so be ready for that. Now it mainly does this 3 hit combo, but that 3rd attack will either be a 4 charge, a sweep, or that jump attack we just saw at the start. As long as you're not spamming dodges, you'll be able to react in time to see what that next attack is. Now after a while they'll start to run on the outside of the arena, and if that sword goes directly up, watch out for that beam attack. From here it'll do this room clearing sweep. If you played Rising Xan, then you know what to do. But yeah, it does 2 full rotations, so just dodge or jump over these. For me, this is easily the best boss in the entire game. This is constant back and forth where you need to keep an eye out for those different enders and be ready to react in time. And of course, near the end of the game we take on Death. Just hug the corner, he'll either toss out this flame wheel that tracks you, but since you're close up, a single dodge can get it to overshoot. Same with those scythe attacks, just wide sweeps you can easily dodge. And you gotta have those little scythes to come out too. So just dash step out of block stun and it'll work fine enough. It's a very simple boss that's not too bad honestly. What makes it tough though is that you'll most likely have no resources because you're tossed right into this boss fight after dealing with that final standoff against Isaac so if you can get his boss fight down you'll do fine here. And for the final boss, Dracula. 
First thing to note is that you don't need to hit his head to deal damage. You can attack wherever. Okay, if these wings appear, he'll teleport and go in for a grab. Just give it a sec and then double jump away to avoid it. But as we should know by now, he's always had a few projectile attacks. We either toss out these slow moving red orbs that explode after some time, or if you make your way behind, you'll be fine to line a few hits. Or he'll toss out these trailing icicles at you. Just make a wide arc and you'll be good to close back in to get a few hits. He also has a laser attack or this fire pillar to get you off him. Super solid fight that doesn't last too long, but it reminded me of a lot of wild like Nevin in DMC3. For phase 2, we have this platform to fight on. And this time you need to watch out for those melee attacks instead. We either be the straight on jab, sweeps, or slam. Just know those attacks will leave this lingering blood trail that'll hurt you if touched. Okay, when he flies back, he'll do a few attacks. But luckily, there's colors associated to each one. Green for tracking shots to roll from, blue for shockwave to jump over, or purple for the sweeping beam that always turns clockwise. Just watch out for that mix up burn knuckle. It's actually a really fun fight that ends things off on a high note. And that's Castlevania Curse of Darkness. Huh. Has some neat concepts, but it came off feeling like a prototype with a lot of half ideas. So we visit the mountainside, abandoned town, caves, and even the clock tower. But it has the same problem we just saw in Chaos Legion. Just square rooms attached together by narrow hallways. It's all just flat and spacious rooms that take quite a bit to get through, even if you beeline it. It's pretty boring as you'd imagine, but you better get used to it because that's how every major area is built. Kinda hard to miss. It doesn't help that your base movement speed is just way too slow for how large these areas can be. Maybe if they gave you a version of Sonic Dash, now that would have been a worthwhile ID ability to have, but instead we're forced to slowly march on through these repetitive, formulaic areas. From the beginning of the game, all the way through Jackalus Castle. There's no variety whatsoever, turning an interesting game into a chore the further it goes on. And the enemies you do fight along the way are kind of just tossed at you with no interesting groupings, and it doesn't help that you can just walk past them with little to no pushback, so they're not exactly threatening enough to warrant this empty arena setup like other action games where we need to stay on the move constantly. I'm going to bring it up again, but without those switch ups in gameplay, things will become extremely stale pretty quick too as we clearly see here because if we go from room to room just to fight and that's it yeah for most this isn't enough to create a full action game on we need ways to get us to rethink our approach how can we use our movement through platforming or positioning with stage hazards or even room gimmicks to add an extra layer to our decision making this goes a long way to keep gameplay fun and interesting because without this variety most games will be solved within minutes since they offer nothing outside of their bare bone enemy and level design. And well, since Castlevania has built itself entirely around those two concepts, working in tandem with one another, yeah, it's a huge letdown to see it get completely abandoned here. I would go as far as to say the absence of that sort of structure to its overall design makes it a bad Castlevania game. That's why 64, to me, is a better 3D game. Hot take, I know, but it actually attempted to use different room layouts to create unique encounters that combine platforming and combat. A lot more faithful to the spirit of Castlevania than the nothingness that's going on here. So yeah, enemies are too passive, which makes those wide array of weapons we can craft and those enders irrelevant since we can mash. And exploring in general is non-existent with their linear empty rooms, having those ID abilities borderline useless. A lot of what ifs with this one. Sucks too because the main selling points, crafting and IDs, are pretty well thought out. Creating this nice blend or feedback loop between real-time action gameplay and RPG mechanics that reinforce each other. Just falls flat, Sally, since enemies aren't fully developed. And without solid enemies, you don't have a good action game. Hey, if you want something with in-depth RPG elements, crafting, tons of different weapons with their own unique movesets, extensive amount of customization over every part of the loadout, which includes this Pokemon-like summoning system, and of course fight enemies that put up a real challenge, Play Neo 2. It's everything this game aimed to do, but a lot better. I'll give it props though for being ahead of its time, but just didn't stick the landing. In my opinion, I think it would have been a good idea if they made this into a 2D game instead. Could have kept their scope focused in on what they did best in the past, because we didn't really gain much here for going 3D, you know. But man, they made sure to give it their all because the classic hallmarks of Igavania are here. There's a hidden boss, and once defeated, they'll unlock a boss rush. When you beat the game, you'll unlock crazy mode, 
taking on larger crowds of tougher enemies. You can even play as Trevor Belmont for the entire game too. Get to use a vampire killer now and you start with every sub weapon, item crashes included. There's even different whips to find. It would be awesome to approach the game in a new way, forming new strategies. But like I mentioned earlier, level design is extremely bland and enemies are stand-ins. So I don't see the point in putting up with all that downtime again. All of its issues aside, can tell they put in the effort to give players a complete package at least. That's something we can appreciate, right? Yeah, if you ever missed out on this one, I say give it a chance, maybe? Keep your expectations in check though, because it's not exactly an awful time, but they really test your patience with how cookie cutter everything is. So it just really depends how much you can tolerate this sort of thing before the monotony drives you mad.